So yes, uh, when I hear byte man, uh, actually I think about byte code manipulation. Uh, that's where the name came from. Uh, at its very core, byte man is a fault, ingest, fault injection testing framework. Actually, uh, before I get too far, how many current byte man users do we have in the room? Great, so I can say anything I want. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, may, maybe I should take this as a, uh, as a hint, because I'm always the, the person kind of foisting this tool on other people. Uh, I took it to Raytheon, I took it to TD Ameritrade through someone else, and then I ended up at TD Ameritrade. Maybe, maybe no one really likes this tool, and it's just <laughs> me. <laughs> um, OK, so fault injection testing. Uh, who's ever heard of Netflix's Chaos Monkey? Okay, wonderful tool. Uh, turns out the only GIF I could find for the Chaos Monkey was Amazon because they've adopted it. The Chaos Monkey is a um, process with a set of canned actions that runs as an agent um, in your production deployment or your integration test deployment and goes around killing processes, severing network links, unmounting drives, doing really, really horrible things to your application, things that most applications will not withstand. Um, as it turns out, that is the best way to test for things like that, is to actually cause those failures. Um, the other way to test for that usually involves manipulating your application at the source level to try and simulate those failures. And then we end up in a situation where we're not really testing exactly what we're deploying. And we've all been there. So for me, fault, fault injection testing is a way to actually cover all those little nooks and crannies in the coverage report that always seem to get missed. All of those uh, IO exceptions that you never, ever see happen because the network never drops out while you're running your unit tests or you can't make the network drop out while you're running your unit tests. Or I'm sure we've all seen those exceptions where someone does a catch in a log with a comment that says, this should never happen, impossible. <laughs> uh, I've heard the case where people say, OK, well, that's great. If it's impossible, put system.exit right after it. Right? Well, now we don't have to do that. Now we can actually test what the system does when we end up in that catch block and how, it, how it's going to behave. So I guess I kind of skipped ahead here as to why we should do fault injection testing. But it's important that we are able to practice failing in a controlled environment. So if we can do this in our integration test environment, we can do this while the proper eyes are watching the system, right? Because just causing the failure is only half of it. Uh, usually the first time we cause the failure, we learn something. And you have to be watching at the right time, the right place to learn that thing. Um, so if we can use fault injection to cause those errors at the right time, we're much more likely to um, observe what we need to. The other part of fault injection testing that is beneficial is that a lot of times you're not going to get cooperation with some of the systems that you need to test against faults. Uh, think about an FTP that is run by you know, some corporation outside your own. And that FTP is constantly hanging up on you or constantly just hanging on you. And you can see it in the stack trace. You do a JSTAC, and you see you're sitting right there at socket.read. And you're like, OK, well, what's going on here? How do I simulate this? How do I test this? How do I make sure my application doesn't wait for 30 seconds? Because 30 seconds is an eternity to a computer program. How do I prove that my application is configured not to wait? in my unit tests without having to go all the way out to prod and, and have that failure occur. Um, and I already mentioned the point about the coverage. So ByteMan, ByteMan primarily used for fault injection testing, but it's so Swiss Army knifey that it has um, the ability to serve as a couple other different tools. The next tool or the next thing you can do with it is you can use it in a production environment to add tracing debug output after the fact. So you know you have that guy who thinks his code is self-documenting and doesn't put any log statements in, uh, no matter what. 
and his code's now breaking. And we can't shut down the system because it's the middle of the day and we have you know, a million transactions running through the system. What are we going to do? How are we going to find out what's going on without interfering with all of customer access to the system? Well, we can actually use ByteMan after the application's already running without any pre-configuration. Yes, yes, oh, yes, true. it's true. Um, with a little bit of pre-planning, it's true. <laughs> there are the two requirements. One, you need the tools.jar. And uh, two, you need the attachment API present in your JVM. The attachment API is available in JDK's 1.6 up, 1.6 and up, I believe. OK, so we can actually add tracing. We, we don't just add tracing or debug output to our applications. We can add tracing and debug output deep in other third-party libraries so that we can find out why Hibernate's generating this really stupid query that we've never seen in development, but all of a sudden it's coming out in prod and the DBAs are screaming at us. Can you, do you get the sense I've had a lot of these hair on fire moments <laughs> throughout my entire career? <laughs> like all these are, are, are examples from, uh, from previous experiences. Okay, so the next one is the poor man's profiler. You're on a project, no money, uh, you got this out of memory error, you see from J, you know, from a, uh, from a heap dump that all of a sudden you've got this class blacklist that's filling up and you don't know why. What's happening? Why are all these entries from this class blacklist filling up in this map uh, and taking all of your memory? Well, why don't we start tracing allocations of the entries in that map and find out, ex you know, start collecting statistics and find out exactly where those map entries are coming from. And then we'll find out they're from Hibernate because Hibernate calls class.forname on every single uh, token in your query. And so if you're not using prepared statements properly, you're putting unique IDs in queries and then giving that to Hibernate, uh, that class block list is going to fill up. The next use for ByteMan uh, is concurrency testing. So it has a lot of built-ins for taking a bunch of threads and asserting that they've all gotten to the same place, making them wait until they get to uh, certain places in their execution before releasing them in a controlled order. So you can set up really, really awful things like make sure that this guy has already acquired the lock, but he pauses just after he, you know, calls that monitor enter and waits until some other um, thread comes up and tries to hit the same monitor enter, maybe in a different bit of code, but it's the same monitor. Um, and, you know, we can test that we don't have statement interleaving problems, deadlock type scenarios. Uh, wow, I really, I. I just keep jumping ahead in my slides here. OK, so what did I miss? <laughs> uh, runtime trace after deployment. Mm. Oh, yeah. With ByteMan, you can say, say you've got an exception that's happening in the system. And all you get is you know, the name of the exception. That's it. You don't get a stack trace. You don't get a line number. You don't get a whatever. All you know is that somehow that exception is being created. Better yet, it's null pointer exception, which <laughs> is usually found in just about any other library you can you know, think of, and it's used for flow control, which is not what you're supposed to do, but we do it. Um, so I've actually used ByteMan in the past to kind of locate those swallowed exceptions, log them, find out where they're coming from, and contain them. Um, if you just are looking to find out what's going on in a method, you can log method parameters, results. You can actually get in there and monkey with log with method parameters and results prior to the method uh, actually seeing them. Um, and doing this is probably a, a less intrusive way than putting the system in debug and letting a developer sit there at the console while requests are piling up behind him as he F6s through the code to try and figure out what's going on, or she, to uh, try to figure out what's going on. And you know, all of a sudden, we're out of threads in this pool because 16, 17 uh, breakpoints have been hit. 
Uh, and then I already mentioned about adding logging to third-party libraries deep in, because uh, everything's open source now, and you can just control click through on Eclipse to find what you need. Uh, find that line, find that method, add a log statement to it. Okay, so yeah, again, I've got a slide for everything I already talked about, so let's just make sure I didn't miss anything. I apologize for the poor organization here. Uh, count method uh, invocations. Oh, yeah, okay, so also other parts of profiling that I didn't mention, right? Timing execution of methods. Uh, we have the ability to set up individually named timers in the system and create, the, create those timers, get the elapsed time, print it out. Anytime I'm talking about printing out output from, uh, from Byteman, you can either print it straight out to the console, you can print it straight out to the standard error, or you can set up a named trace log uh, and put it out to that. Um, object creation, mutation, sure. Um, and we'll go in, I'll go into more detail about how exactly you would go tracing mutation of particular fields and, and variables uh, in the later slides. I'm going to wait for those slides. Um, oh, yeah. So then part of profiling, right, is sometimes we set up our profiler to do periodic sampling. You know, I'm, I want to take a sample of the number of these classes present in the system every 20 seconds or every 20th invocation of this method, I want to take a sample, or I just want to run wide open, I don't know what the heck's going on, and I want to track every single invocation of this one method, log out the parameters to see what's going on. Byteman has the ability to do all those. Um, yeah, find out which class is creating those map entries. <laughs> okay, so what you have in front of you right now is the basic atomic component of a Byteman rule. This rule, um, can be with Byteman libraries syntax checked against your source code using a Maven or Ant plug Maven plugin or an Ant task. Um, rules have a name; it's basically the primary key. You try to insert the same rule twice; it's just going to overwrite the rule. Uh, you can do just about. I'm skipping ahead again. <laughs> rules are freeform text, um, and yeah, I already said same name rule will replace the existing rule. The next part is class binding. We're just going to tell Byteman, I need you to focus on this class, except you can do more than that. You can say, I need you to focus on this abstract class, so you'll pick up uh, all calls to that m implementation in the abstract no matter what the concrete is. You can also say, I need, <laughs> you can also say, I need you to bind to an interface method, well, an interface, and then um, it will go out in the JVM and find all of the implementations of those interface methods and transform them. Uh, one of the tricks there, though, is say you have um, abstract list implements list, and you have an array list, and you think that you would like to track, uh, I, let's assume list.add is implemented in uh, abstract list. I don't think it is, but let's assume. So if you were trying to track list.add, and you did array list.add in the uh, class binding, that actually would not work unless you added the caret prefix to bind to the parent implementation. It, it just it does a deeper search when you use the caret. You're also able to monkey with the Java Lang star classes uh, by putting Byteman on the boot class path and setting a I really know what I'm doing property um, as a uh, April Fool's trick one time I changed a JVM to print out somebody's name for every string. Uh, so it's, it's super powerful. And then you, everyone's probably familiar with the, the dollar notation for inner classes. You can also bind to inner classes uh, using that same notation. So the next part, the meet, the method. Hey, I'm getting better at this. 
Um, if you omit all the parameters in the method specification, it will bind to all the overloaded implementations. They'll just say, OK, I understand you want everything. Uh, you can bind to constructors using init. And you can also bind to static methods. Any questions so far? Please do interrupt if you have them. So, uh, sorry, your rule then will find a constructor in the socket class that only accept the socket address and like those parameters. So those three parameters, yes. Okay. It will. So, exactly. Um, so then the next part is the location specifier. So now we found the bit of code that we want to bind to, but where are we going to do it? Are we going to do it before, after, somewhere in the middle? Um, turns out that there are a lot of location specifiers. So at method entry, at method exit, if you have the debugging symbols in your code at a particular line number, um, at read of a field, at the the read of a named field or at the sixth read in the method, which you need to sort of see through the code to the bytecode to understand how many reads are really going on if you're going to start using the numeric indexes. Um, same thing after write of a particular field or at write. Um, upon method invocation. Yeah, Matt. So if your stuff has been compiled with debug, so it knows about line numbers, mm -hmm. can you say, I want to stop in the foobar method on line 20? Yes. Not, not even just stop. I want to change the value that line 20 is about to use before line 20 executes. Or I want to, totally jumping ahead, but. I want to inject something in there. I, I want to make it throw an exception right here. I want to kill the JVM. I want to go off and run these other 20 methods and come back. I want to wait for five minutes. I, I want to do just about anything you can do with software before executing line 20 or after. Um, we've got the uh, location specifiers for monitor enter, monitor exit, and then at throw, which would be when your code calls throw and pushes an exception onto the stack. Not so much when something has been thrown out of a third-party library and you're dealing with it now. Um, there's also a feature in the queue for a future Byteman release uh, for at catch, which is kind of cool. OK, so now we know what piece of code we're doing or dealing with. We know at what location around that particular bit of code we're going to operate. Uh, the next bit in the rule is just kind of setting up some nice syntactic stuff. Um, we're just going to bind some name variables. Uh, the overall syntax is the name of the variable, colon, the Java type. It doesn't have to be fully qualified. Byteman will pretty much figure it out if it's a java.net.socket and you just say socket. It'll get it figured out. Um, the expression can be any valid expression you could come up with. It could be the result of a method. So if you wanted to uh, call some static method in a class that you're not even operating on at that very moment, but it's a class that's available to you in, in your JVM, that works. If you want to do some math, if you want to, uh, I, it, it's it's kind of limitless. I could stand here and, and listen <laughs> list them all night. They do have some special variables available for you. So typically, with each location specifier, the special variables are going to be different. But dollar zero is going to be the the class that was listed in the class specifier. Dollar uh, one, dollar two, method arguments because normally we're binding to a method. We're inside that method or around it somehow. Uh, dollar caret for at throw. Yes? Yeah. Um, when you said the expression, is that code executed in the context of where you're using it? It is. So any, any local variable is uh, available. Uh, anything that's in scope is available. So, but if it's injected like in an EJB, you get the container? Like, would it 
Yes. Yes, because it's transforming your bytecode to uh, inject that expression at that moment. Um, and then there are a bunch of built-in operation uh, operations that we're going to cover in just a second. Okay, so every rule has a condition. Uh, if you just want the rule to execute, say if true. I don't know why, but you can't seem, it doesn't seem that you can omit the condition. So they gave you a simple uh, literal. But the condition can be any valid expression that evaluates to a Boolean. So once again, the result of any method, um, any of the bound variables from the, line, the lines above. Oh yeah, I, I did, forgot to mention that. With bind variables, you can bind multiples. You just have to uh, delimit them with a semicolon. So then once you clear that condition, if it ends up being true, we'll move on to the do, the actual what are we going to try to monkey with here. And the do, again, multiple expressions, delimit them with semicolons. Um, any valid Java expression or any number of the built-ins or if you have a custom helper, which I'll go over later, you can call methods from your custom helper. If you write the helper, uh, I have a. If you write the helper, you sort of reduce the coupling between your code and your ByteMan scripts, which is nice because that helper can then be used, be maintained with the tools that you're probably more used to maintaining it with. Um, though I do really recommend if you have a bunch of ByteMan scripts, use the Maven plugin. Syntax check them against uh, your project on each build. And then just rule end at the end. Yeah, well, they get out of date, and then you get frustrated. No one wants to use it because it just becomes a maintenance hassle. So all the built-in actions, uh, a number of different categories here. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Yes. Uh, one file, no naming convention, uh, with as many ru rules in it as you like. Yep. So then how you would package them would be governed by what collections you want to submit to the JVM. Because generally, the, the tools allow you to submit one file's worth of rules at a time. I think there is a way you can say out of this file only inject this one rule. But I don't like typing that many arguments or remembering that many arguments. OK, so <laughs> categories of built-in action types. Uh, debug and trace. Debug being just print out to standard out. Trace being uh, print out to standard out unless I've configured a file for you to trace to, because generally you know, trace ends up being a lot more output. So we, we should put it in a file instead of letting it fly by on the console. Uh, timers to measure elapsed time. Counters to count events. To um, and when you're trying to orchestrate tests, to say, you know what, the first three times I go through this method, I don't want you to do anything. I'm going to make this counter part of my rule condition, so that you know only on the fourth time do I want you to throw an exception. Um, Flags, very simple. Hey, I'm going to set this flag, this named flag, to status yes. Some other rule comes along and is able to then use that as a condition, whether it should execute or not. So then you can start getting the rules talking to each other through these named values. Um, waiters and joiners for doing thread coordination and making sure that you can properly interleave the executions of those threads. 
and then life cycle. So in, only in a test environment, if you really, really want to kill a thread or a JVM to simulate a hard failure. Um, there's an extension to ByteMan called dtest, which is for distributed testing, where they do things like that. They kill um, the, the guy that, that helps maintain J groups, Bella Bon. Uh, he'll use it to set up a bunch of J groups cluster nodes, and then he'll kill off the heartbeat thread on one of them and w assert that the rest of them properly respond to that. And then also that the uh, one that lost its heartbeat thread can properly rejoin the J groups cluster without getting your cluster kind of cleaved into. If you've ever used J groups, you know that any single J groups node thinks that it's king and it will try and convince other J groups members to join it. Um, and so you can end up with one cluster becoming two or three, and that's no good. Rule helpers. So like I was saying, little bits of code. POJOs, they help you. Uh, the only requirement is that they extend their abstract helper. Um, you would install them with the helper keyword, just giving the fully qualified class name in your rule. Um, I don't know if a rule can have multiple helpers. I know that you can install multiple helpers at the same time for different rules. And then, because it's a POJO, you just, your uh, ByteMan code calls the public instance methods, and it does reduce the coupling. Question. Yeah? So the helper has to be written beforehand? The helper, well, be beforehand, or, or if your situation's long enough, yeah, in the middle. But if you have to deploy your app again with the helper before you... No. Do, no? Uh, well... Depends on your container. If your container is able to pick up uh, new packages, or if you're able to then take the ByteMan jar and the helper jar, or the, and, and insert the helper into it, and insert that at runtime, you should be fine. So integrating ByteMan into your application is rather easy. Uh, no source code modification required. Oh, I've only been going for half an hour. OK. Um, but you do need Java 1.6. You can install it into any running JVM as long as you have tools.jar and the attach API. Or if you want to prep your application, say in an integration test scenario, for submitting ByteMan scripts after the fact, you could start the JVM with the Java agent argument. And um, it would essentially do nothing until you accept open a port and listen for incoming scripts until you actually submitted a script or submitted a rule to it. Once the agent's loaded, there is no current feature for unloading the agent, though you can unload the rules that you've submitted with pretty good accuracy. Um, I've found that the, the number of class loaders that your application has um, is proportional, or uh, well, sorry, the difficulty with which you'll have in unloading rules and retransforming those classes to their original is proportional to the number of class loaders your application has. So if it's something like JBoss with a bunch of wars and you know all sorts of craziness, um, you might sometimes have trouble getting those classes back to the original. So this is something you're going to want to test. This is something you're going to want to verify before you go adding it to production. But this you want to reinstall everything. Well, you don't have to reinstall because it's, it's only transforming in memory. Oh, okay. um, it's just that you're gonna if you, yeah, you're going to have to restart. Okay. And sometimes that's not an option. Okay, so th three rules that were three ways we can get uh, rules into a JVM. The first one is the just adding the script to the Java agent argument when we start the JVM, or ByteMan ships with uh, a couple utilities 
that are uh, capable of connecting to that port that it's listening on and submitting the scripts. Or during tests, surprise, surprise, there is a pardon me, JUnit runner. And then you can actually annotate your individual test methods with the BM rule annotation, which is just kind of another way of uh, laying out your rule. So you can say, before you run this test, add this rule. After you run the test, make sure that uh, uh, make sure that you retransform everything so that it goes back to the original. So I prepared a sample application. Um, yeah, it's not all talking and, and uh, slides, but this is a very, very simplified, horrible application to demonstrate ByteMan's capabilities. Um, it's something, it's a very naive example from my domain at TDA where I work with short selling of securities. Uh, sometimes a security gets kind of oversold on the short side and the exchanges will have to publish this data as a regulatory requirement to say, I'm sorry, no one can short sell this security anymore because it's way too oversold and we're doing a lot of bad things to its price. So this application is, uh, is a very dumbed down version of our tool, which goes out and downloads that data, parses it, inserts it into a database. Um, I'll make the, the application available should you really be all that curious, but it's kind of self-contained. Uh, it runs on an embedded derby, and it has ByteMan integrated into it in, in a couple of different ways. It has bugs. It's supposed to have bugs. It's, this is a talk about bug hunting software. Uh, so I think we're going to actually fix the, the nastiest concurrency bug here live. Let me go find Eclipse here. So, hmm, I'm trying to remember what I want to show you first. Let's go to the first example where uh, this wasn't necessarily from, from this application, but uh, in the past I had, I dealt with an FTP server that was just randomly hanging on us for no good reason. Um, we had the darndest time getting the SFTP client that we were using at the time to actually set the socket timeouts and use them reliably to assert that our application wouldn't completely tie up this one thread while uh, you know, their FTP server was screwing with us. So what I did was I created, here let me go, uh, let me go show you the, the FTP downloader. Eh. So this guy just tries to use Apache FTP client to do a simple connect. Those aren't supposed to be in there yet. That's the fix. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use ByteMan to simulate that hang. Oh yeah, that's what I wanted to show. Instead of uh, relying on a real FTP server, I integrated mock FTP server, which is rather sweet, or fake FTP server, sorry. Should you ever need an FTP server for testing, uh, this one's rather simple. You set up the port, set up a user account, and then create a file system. That file system doesn't necessarily have to uh, map to your underlying file system whatsoever. Really, you're just defining directories and files. Um, it has two implementations, one for Unix, one for Windows of the underlying file system. Uh, it gets much more complicated than this. I tried to keep it to as few lines as possible just for demonstration. Um, so then 
when I run my unit tests, Spring is going to uh, create this mock FTP server bean for me and start one up. And I have a test download just to prove that it works. And then a Hmm, where's my J unit view? You can see it in the upper left, it's green. Oh, yeah, there we go. So this is actually my wife's laptop, not mine. So uh, Eclipse is not completely configured here. Okay, so it's green, so the download works. Let's, uh, let's actually test what happens when we add this rule. Oh, I have two implementations of this. Okay, so here, check this out. This is the rule. This is the underlying rule, where in the fake FT the mock FTP server, um, when the client side calls retrieve, the mock FTP server is going to call this retrieve command handler. I'm just asking the retrieve command handler to wait for someone else to show up with this ID for 30 seconds. Well, that's never going to happen because this is the only rule in the system. So what I'm essentially doing is I'm pausing the, instead of doing a thread.sleep here, um, I'm just pausing the execution in the middle of this rule and then it'll carry on after 30 seconds. The This is going to fail, though, because I took out the fix. Yeah, so it's just, it's just waiting. So now we've, one of my favorite quotes from Paul, actually, is never trust a, a test that, doesn't, that you have not seen fail, which I think you borrowed from someone else, but you're the person I heard it from, right? So uh, this test here, if we give it a few more seconds, it'll eventually fail. No, it'll eventually succeed. Sorry, that's the problem, though, right, is that we're all sitting here while this thread's waiting. Um, while we're waiting, I guess maybe I could show you the other way that we inject ByteMan, and that's through this BM rule. Uh, annotation here. So the same thing, we're just giving it a target class target method, the condition is true, and then you'll see that same wait for 30 seconds. So that's how you use the uh, annotations in line instead of having to submit them. So now let's go out and uh, let me go back to my downloader and we'll put the, the timeouts back in. Oh yeah, so we expected the exception, the socket timeout exception, right? Didn't happen. But now with the timeouts, after proving that we can successfully hang it forever, JUnit runs green because we're able to assert that after adding these timeouts, the socket actually uh, returns when the FTP server is hanging. Oh, sure. Um, okay, maybe. <laughs> I also use win clips on Windows on a daily basis, so my keyboard shortcuts are a little, a little sketchy. So what I did was, yes, I, I essentially went to uh, fake, fake FTP server, 
come on. The source is in there. Find it. It's downloading it. Once again, wife's laptop. Maven's not primed on this one. But anyway, as long as it's in the fake FTP server code, the JUnit test is waiting on the, on the line, right? That's, it's in a network call as long as we're hanging it anywhere that's being excited by. Well, I could have, but I wanted to make sure that I was getting it inside the fake FTP server, not so much um, on the client side. I wanted to definitely simulate that the server was what was <coughs> hanging. Because doing it, we were actually trying to configure properties of java.net.socket, right? So I wouldn't necessarily want to inject uh, the hang right there. Actually, I guess they're parameters of socket factory that make it into java.net socket. There is a way to comment, uh, hash. Yep. After a while, yeah. Um, sure. So can you show us, maybe I missed it, but how did you make sure that this rule went into the JVM, the simulate FTP? So this one actually was not. This was the, the, the format that you're accustomed to looking to. When I was actually running the unit test. Through the annotation. Right? Uh, it was through the annotation. Oh, cool. And so then the annotation actually had every one of these individual parts okay. in it. Yeah. Um, Is there a way to tell the annotation, hey, go read in this file over there? I think so. Okay. I didn't do that this time. But I think there is, yes. Because you wouldn't want to duplicate it, of course. If you've got these scripts that you, you run in production, or not in production, but integration test, and you want to run them in unit test as well. Um, okay, so the next one, uh, just some simple profiling. So this one has a couple rules in it. Uh, the first rule, the, the overall goal of this is just to time how long it takes to execute a particular DAO method. So this is my threshold security DAO class. Notice it's not fully qualified. I was sufficiently convinced that there was no other class on Earth named Threshold Security DAO. Uh, well, the, there is in my code base, but that one's not here. Um, so, on the at entry of the save method, we're going to go ahead and go ahead and grab the thread ID because that's uh, going to contribute to our unique name for the timer. And we're going to then create a timer with that unique name so that you know this one thread is entering the method. We're going to create our timer. Upon exit, we're going to ask it to print out the elapsed time. We need to name that timer. We need to have the same name for that timer replicated in the second rule here. So, and we don't want to just use, say, threshold security DAO timer because then you would have multiple threads that are calling that um, one method kind of all fighting each other to reset the timer and you just wouldn't get accurate timings. Um, so here's an example of you know doing some multiple bindings and using a using both uh, Java valid Java expressions and this is a built-in get elapsed time from timer inside the bindings. So then we just print so some. Does this automatically cast itself to the type it is? Like the threshold ID, the thread ID, is that a string? Or? Uh, that is a, an int or a long, but uh, in Java, it, in, in anywhere in Java, string not. plus int always ends up uh right, but you didn't have to declare a thread ID in the first top. You just said Oh, it didn't care what type it was? Right, no, I guess I could have. Technically I could have said thread ID colon uh int. Yeah. But no. Okay. 
So then. Not that I found. If so, it does the same syntax check that it would do during the build when it's trying to inject your rule, right. and it won't let you inject a broken rule. Okay. Right. It may let you inject a rule that will do bad things that is syntactically correct, but it will not let you in, uh, inject a, a syntactically, so when you go to inject, syntactically you incorrect. Yep, yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, the DAO timer here. If we run this and then check the console, I've got a file of these threshold security records that uh, has a bunch of them in it. And here are our uh, debug outputs. So it's giving us the rule name. And then this was just the text that I put in the debug output. And it's saying it took two milliseconds, one millisecond, to complete those operations. Um, here I'll show you. Looks like we've got a little bit of a concurrency bug here because a couple of components of this, the uh, threshold security parser says it parsed 61 records, but the threshold security oh. inserter says it only processed 57. So um, that's going to lead us into the next demonstration where we've got a kind of a terrible concurrency pattern going on between these two objects um, on purpose. I really feel like I have to disclaim this so that no one goes, holy moly, this guy does not know what he's doing. Um, OK, so the parser task here, very simple run. Oh, I guess maybe I need to go to the parse records. So for all the lines in this file, in the input file, um, he's going to try and parse out a threshold security, put it in an output queue, which is a blocking queue, and then he's going to increment the parsed record count. When he's done with that, he sets no more records to true. That blocking queue is important because that's how we talk to the inserter task. The inserter task actually takes a reference to the parser task because I wish this tooltip would go away. I want to turn that off. The, uh, the inserter task takes from the input queue, does a DAO save, and then checks to see that no more records is still false. So I imagine you all can see how we're getting this, uh, you know, we're getting fewer records inserted than we are parsed because the parser hurries up and does all of its work and then it sets that flag. Well, the inserter, it's the first time that that value is available as true, it bails out of the do while when the blocking queue still had records left in it. We can actually use ByteMan and some inline rules to make sure that this error occurs, or to, to make sure that the, the, th the operation interleaving that causes this error occurs. So, This is a just without byte man. I've set up a couple mock objects here using jmocket, uh, the parser task and the inserter task. The DAO and the parser do nothing. They uh, deal with this really stock canned threshold security. So I set up a couple expectations. So parser. Uh, with any string, I don't care, is going to get called twice because the input file we're using has two records in it. Um, the result it's going to return is that can threshold security. 
The mock DAO is going to take any threshold security. It's going to expect to be called twice. So we're taking all of the kind of variables out of the equation here. Do the configuration that the application has to do by setting the parser task into the inserter task so that they can link up on that blocking queue. And then uh, an executor service runs both runnables. When we run this, uh, we get some non-deterministic behavior, which is why the timeout's on it. So usually what happens is, yeah, parse threshold uh, records. So the parser is done, and the uh, inserter somehow ended up waiting forever. So then what that tells me is that the inserter passed the while condition after, or slightly before the parser set it so that the, the other component would bail out of the while. But this was after the blocking queue was already empty. So that's one possible interleaving, right? Where the inserter beats it, the value doesn't get over to that thread, because we're using no synchronization whatsoever to communicate this Boolean value on purpose. And the, um, the inserter just ends up waiting forever. So then my JUnit timeout ends up firing. Actually, no. What, what happened was, uh, sorry, executor.await termination returned false. And so we know that not all the threads exited cleanly. So now, if we come down here, we can actually kind of set up both of those situations. The first si the situation we just experienced was that the inserter blocked on uh, an empty queue while missing the no more records signal. The other case that we can get is where the inserter prematurely sees the no more records signal, which is what we saw when I ran the big example with you know 50 or 60 records in it. Um, it said, well, I parsed 61, and it said, well, I inserted 57. So it was prematurely seeing that value and then not draining the, the rest of the blocking queue. Um, the rules that we use, that's just a name. So pause inserter after wait signal. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in order to, to create these thread interleavings, I'm going to say, because this is the premature case, I'm going to make sure that the inserter task at the entry of the run method waits until the parser has already set the value. So if the, if the parser does all of its work prior to, because the, the blocking queue, it's, it's, uh, its bound is more than two at this point. So it can do 100% of its work before the parser even, or before the inserter does anything, takes any records off the queue. Um, so it's going to wait for this named signal. The inserter. Uh, I think probably, let's see, let's go to the location. At exit of the run method is going to send a signal to wake up to the parser, to the inserter. So now we're setting a definite happens before relationship there. Uh, not in the case of synchronization, but at least in, you know, just wall clock timing. So we're guaranteeing that this occurs and this is going to fail. I should just run all of them so they all fail. We can talk about them while they're failing. The next rule, this one's a bit more complicated. 
because what we're going what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the here I got to reread these to figure out what we're doing. Oh come on, bite man, stop. So the inserter class um, in the run method at entry is going to create a countdown. We know that there are two records that it needs to parse. So it's going to create a countdown with value 1. A countdown um, can be used as a condition to a rule, which is what we're doing here. So the first time we hit the countdown, by executing here, oh, and where did we bind that? Let's double check. After invocation of is no more records. So if we go back to insert or task, what we're saying is, is that the first time we're at this point right here between these two lines, um, do nothing. Just count down. The second time we invoke this, what's going to happen? is we're going to send a wake up signal to the parser. The parser is waiting for us. At line 41 in its run method. So it's waiting right here. So what we've essentially said is we're going to drain the queue before we even get a chance to set the no more records to true to let that inserter task or task go all the way back to the take and then get stuck there forever. So all these failed in some way or another. So now let's go and let's actually fix this class. Let's take a really naive approach to fixing it. How do I get back to my code here? One way we could uh, fix the inserter is instead of take, let's do poll. And let's wait five, five seconds. And I happen to know that, you know, well, if, if poll hits the timeout, let's just skip this and go down to the while. Now, at the while, we probably need to add another condition, right? Or See what's the name of the method? Peak. So peak um, will return null if the queue is empty. So we're going to go while is no more records is false or peak while we have more records basically peak is not null um, for good measure we probably ought to go synchronize these two methods just so that we don't accidentally leak something there between the two threads because this is called by one thread this is called by another but they're going to share the same monitor. So now if we go back and rerun that JUnit test, big money, big money, no whammy. So by using ByteMan here, you're forcing testing conditions that otherwise you don't know if they're triggering or not. Yes. So thank you for summing up my long ramble <laughs> of code. Sorry, I, I didn't realize, uh, I, I was doing this on like a 21 inch screen. I didn't realize uh, how constrained these were going to be when I uh, presented. So I hope that you're able to see the rules.
OK. Uh, so all green. We broke the test, proved that those interleavings actually caused really bad things to occur. We went, we fixed the class, we kept the byte man scripts the same, made sure that we guaranteed those interleavings, and now we have one less bug in the system. So are you the creator of all the rules and your egg and uh well I just moved into a position uh, last September and I've not actually convinced my current team to adopt Byte Man. It's um it's in use in the team that sits in the next cube over. because um, a colleague of mine took it there before I got there. So uh, I've not actually been using Byte Man for a while. We're just oh, other other dragons to slay at the moment. Um So functionally, it's the same. Uh, from a lock domain perspective, if you want to, uh, if you want to constrain your lock domains to the tightest they can possibly be, then yes. Because if I'm entering that synchronized method, and somehow later on someone goes and adds another synchronization that has nothing to do with no more records. I'm preventing them from executing. But as long as two threads are um, trying to acquire the same monitor, so you've got, uh, you've got a thread that calls monitor enter on the instance of parser task, and then s before it gives, gives up the lock, you've got another thread that calls monitor enter on the same instance of parser task, which is what we have occurring in this code. Um, the values that are written while thread A has the lock are guaranteed to be visible to thread B when it acquires the lock. As long as you're locking on the same object, it doesn't matter where you're writing. You're acquiring the lock on the object, oh, okay. yeah. not the because there's there's no lock for a method. Okay. That's um, yep. So then, it, it's good to minimize your lock domains yeah. so that you're not accidentally preventing uh, other unrelated operations from occurring. From a correctness perspective, this works. Now, if one of those was static and the other was an instance, it'd be a different story. I, I exactly. I wouldn't be locking on the same lock. OK. Um, I think I have. Oh, yeah. OK. So earlier, I talked about um, the, the silent log and throw exception that um, you know, you just can't figure out where it's occurring. So I have a run configuration here that for some reason, we don't know why. Um, while processing the thousands and thousands of records, we get a Random null pointer exception. Hey, we at least got a line number there, right? So inserter task line 39. Let's go find out how helpful that is. What do you want to bet it's not going to be that helpful? What do you want to bet I made it that way? OK, great. Line 39, wait, that, that's not right. Really? Oh, you know why? Because it's a null pointer exception. 
where's the null pointer exception coming from? Hmm. Up above somewhere, right? What else could be throwing null pointer? Who knows? OK, well, so let's go find out. Let's make Byteman do some tattling for us. Uh, first, I'll show you the rule that actually causes the null pointer. No, you know what? That's kind of like it's kind of like revealing the solution before. Uh <laughs> okay, so this is the rule that is actually going to illuminate where the null pointer exception is coming from. Um, so in the constructor of runtime exception, add entry. Ignore my comment here. If true, I want you to do a trace stack and print 50 lines of the trace. So let's rerun that and see how, f how close that gets us. So would you look at your arguments here before you? Oh, yes, absolutely. Please. Thank you. So application arguments, it's just. Um, using my mock FTP server. What you probably care about is the Java agent here, where I'm giving it the byteman jar, and I'm giving it my cause NPE script and my detect the silent runtime exception script. And then the rest of these are just, this one's key. If you're not getting any output from your, from your uh, rules, it's because you don't have verbose on. Because Byteman, even if it's not executing the rules, is very chatty. So let's run this and blow up the console. Oh, lots and lots of stack traces, right? Uh, fewer than I expected. OK, so where are all these coming from? Threshold security, dio.save. OK, well, gee, why? Why is save failing? I actually happen to have a second rule here that I pre-wrote that displays the security details. So threshold security DAO is what's giving us some runtime exceptions out of our code. Oh. Yeah, let, let me let me uh, let me change this. This is kind of a cool feature. You see, there were a few runtime exceptions. We can actually narrow it down and say add entry of runtime exception at constructor if the caller matches this regex. Then I want you to enter. So instead of getting every runtime exception in the entire system that's happening right then, we're only going to get runtime exceptions where inserter test.run is on the stack somewhere. Which in this application is kind of silly because most of the runtime exceptions are going to be from that one do it all method. But in a container where you've got you know, 60, 70 threads running all at the same time doing independent things, having the filter is going to be useful. Uh, but this security dis display security details rule here is going to give us some help. So at the invocation of the save method, which is where we think we're having the problem, um, go get the record and just print its two string. And that actually already ran. And you can see that my threshold security object here, for no good reason, has a null symbol, which in this particular application happens to be uh, not permitted. So I was able to not only find the runtime exception, but also kind of do some debugging output for a DAO that wasn't well instrumented with current debugging output to log exactly which object is um, causing the error. So then I can go and find what data feed this is coming from and figure out why. 
Um, the way I caused the null pointer, and I can show you that since we've kind of discovered the mystery, is I used a countdown so that I wasn't killing every single one. I said, um, at the constructor of threshold security, create a countdown of 10 if no countdown exists. Then, I'm binding to the exact same method here, aren't I? Uh, string, string, yeah, oh yeah, and I yeah, fully qualified here, not fully qualified here, but I am binding to the exact same constructor. If countdown, which remember, if the countdown is at 10 or 9 or 8 or 1, it's not going to succeed. But if the countdown is down to 0, if we cannot count down any farther, um, it's going to allow it to pass into the rule. And we're saying, OK, I'm just going to reassign the first argument to this method, which happens to be a string, to null. So I'm monkeying with method arguments to create an error that should never occur. Like if you look at the code, there's really no way you could ever get a null in this particular location. Uh, the way the code's written today, it uses string.split. String.split comes out with empty strings, not nulls for empty records, right? But that's the way the code's written today, not the way the code could be written tomorrow or a year from now. So does anybody have any questions on how we created the error, how we found the error? John? OK. Um, could you do kind of the same thing to look for an unexpected hang where you don't have any idea of where exactly it's hanging? If, if if I knew that a system had, had a currently hung thread, I'd probably just go straight to JSTAC. Okay. Because that's going to, you know, you do two JSTAC outputs uh, a minute apart, and you find the one thread that just hasn't budged, and that's going to be your culprit. But if you have an intermittent, pro if you have something that's causing a hang intermittently, and you're trying to mm -hmm. figure out Hmm. Let's see. In general, I, I don't know that it's particularly suited to it. Because I mean what would we what would we try to do? Typically to find a hung thread, um, what we're saying is the thread is sitting in one spot longer than we expect it to. Because in, in your scenario it sounds like it's freeing itself. Right, so we're not in a deadlock scenario. Well, it's not so much that in the particular case that we had to solve once upon a mm -hmm. time, we had a multi-threaded weekend running project that would occasionally hang, a th and that hanging thread would eventually hang the whole machine. And it wasn't, it, it, it didn't happen regularly, and we couldn't reproduce it. So we were looking for tools not to free up the thread, but to mm -hmm. Well, we were looking for those two, but also to figure out why, in rare instances, we were getting the hang. Okay. And so we had a very unrepeat. We had no way of repeat. We we we, we struggled. You couldn't catch it. Wild. You couldn't catch it in the wild, right. basically. Yeah. You know, it's a weekend. No one's there. Right. You don't have. Well, in, in trying to we're trying to simulate it other times, we could generate a hang, but we could not repeatably generate. So as far as repeatedly generating the hang, this is your tool. For finding your particular hang in production, I think there are other tools that are better suited. Okay. But if, if you want to arbitrarily pause execution at any location based on uh, any number of conditions you want to dream up, this is absolutely your tool. Um, so I think, I think this is all the code um, that I have. I've run through all of the Byteman scripts that I had. 
I took you through the concurrency example, which was annotated. Um, so, sure. Oh, sorry. So, if, if I have a Tomcat server, mm -hmm. I'll deploy disabled, and I have a Java agent um, set, and now I'm in production, and oh my god, we forgot to log parameters of this very, very um, call that takes millions of hours or mm -hmm. millions of seconds. And we just want to put the log statement on the parameters or some timing. I have my new byte man script ready to roll. How can I push that to my application server without having to restart again? Is that possible? Yeah, it is. So um, if you have if you have those those two conditions satisfied, uh, the the tools.jar and the attach API, uh, Byteman will use the JVMTI framework uh, to insert the agent. And once the agent's there, it's listening on a port for your operations people to then use the, uh, the BM submit tool to push that rule in its file out to that server. Yes. But the, uh, doing it that way will be the only way how to do it. That would be the only way to do it on a running system you don't want to take down. Okay. Uh, or else I will have to write it, put a comma with the new script, and then roll the server again. Yep. Okay. But it, it does, with simpler application to applications, a few versions ago, it does very well with just, you know, I'm going to transform this class. Okay, you're ready to unload that rule. I'm going to retransform it, put it back to its original. Um, I had some problems with JBoss. This is actually a, a, it's a JBoss product. It was written by the guys who uh, maintain the Arjuna Transaction Manager. Oh yeah, that's kind of one cool use for this that I, I think everybody should actually go out and do unless you know that this is working on your applications right now. If you have an XA data source in your application, you can create in doubt transactions with Byteman so simply that it's not even funny. You have no reason not to test XA recovery because a lot of people find out that once they actually have an in doubt transaction, after their container comes back up, or if you've got a clustered container uh, where you know one, one box goes down, the other box isn't running that XA recovery, or you're missing some grants on Oracle. Uh, not that Oracle is the only XA data source, but or database, but it's what I deal with. So I, I speak in what I deal with. Because um, an in doubt transaction occurs when we have a, a transactional resource that uh, has voted yes to prepare, but then fails on commit or uh, just disappears from the network before commit can be called, right? So then once the database comes back online, that transaction, at least in Oracle, is sitting there in DBA 2 PC pending, waiting for you to do something with it. And what a JTA transaction manager is supposed to do is it's supposed to say, OK, I'm going to go out to the database and query for any, any in doubt transactions. And then I'm going to go ahead and just commit those. Because once they've been prepared, generally, in a simplified world without any crazy database links, an in doubt transaction is supposed to succeed. All the other transactional resources in your overall business transaction have already been uh, mutated. You need to go ahead and just make that right on Oracle. Andrew Din, the guy who wrote most of Byteman, created Byteman originally to basically test all of these crazy JTA scenar scenarios where things go bad in the middle of you know, them doing something on a transactional resource and then writing that, uh, the results of that to their uh, persistent store, you know, because most transaction managers have to have their own persistent store to keep track of what's been done because they don't have a place to keep track of it otherwise. And they need to be able to come back up if they die right in the middle of everything. So yes, XA recovery. That's everyone's homework. Go make sure that XA recovery works on your app. I'll write you the Byteman script, or you can write it yourself. But all you got to do is throw an exception out of uh, XA commit and you know, put a countdown on it so it does it on every 10th one or whatever. And then see what your application does. See if you get a bunch of uh, in-doubt transactions building up in your database. 
and then find out if your container will resolve those automatically or if you have to get your DBAs in there to go in and force commit them. Um, I think one, two more slides and we're good. Question more. Oh, please. Um, don't laugh at me, but... Uh, I won't. Yeah, the, uh, we sometimes have, cannot use the Sun JDK. We have to use the IBM JDK. Do you see uh, problems with tool.jar? Because of... I, I don't know. Okay. If it has the JVMTI framework available, you should be fine. Okay. And the attach API. Uh, have you uh, any experience or heard about how this works with some of the dynamic languages in the JVM? I don't. Sorry. It's all right. So just a couple gotchas and tips. Uh, I mentioned it before, if you're not seeing any debug output, set that property, the verbose property. Um, some location specifiers are going to require that you put your debugging symbols in. Some people like to turn off all the debugging symbols because they think it makes production, production run faster. All it does is make developers lose hair faster. So... Um, is that like line numbers? Yep. Well, so there, there are various levels of debugging symbols that you can leave in or, or cut out. And uh, some people try to strip it all the way down. Um, and then line numbers would be the finest grain that you could go. What's the default? Uh, I, I don't know. Or? I don't know. Okay. I, I've usually explicitly set it uh, in my oh. build tool. Okay. So I, I don't like defaults. So includes all, yeah. um, the warning about cleanly retransforming classes after unloading rules. Test this before you do it in prod. Um, Byteman has the ability to actually compile rules to bytecode. So it will transform your bytecode to go call its interpreted uh, rules. You can actually tell Byteman, no, I, I don't want you to do that. I'm running this in, a, in an environment where performance matters. So I want you to go ahead and compile the rules the, the binds and the do statements to bytecode for me. And then you'll just get that performance hit on the first call when it does that compilation. And you, no way to pre-compile them at the moment. But then after that, they're all running bytecode. Um, I don't know if they're subject to JIT after that point once they're bytecode or not. And if you are going to start using BM unit, um, go ahead and segregate your BM unit tests into individual files. Uh, don't mix them in with your other J unit tests because you probably already have other runners. The, the spring runner, um, the rules runner, like what, whatever you have, it's not going to mix with Byteman. Okay. Thank you very much. Very nice.